Muhammad's followers assert that he was never an idol worshipper, that Allah guided him from childhood away from the pagan beliefs of his parents and tribe. Are these statements borne by the records of Muhammad and Islam itself? As usual with the followers of Muhammad, they invent and concoct mythical stories about him, thus shooting themselves in the mouth because they contradict the very exegetical Muhammadan sources in the Arabic language that prove otherwise. It is an absolute fact that Muhammad was born of pagan parents. His father Abdullah and his mother Amina were both pagans and they used to worship many idols. His entire childhood till the age of 25 years at least was spent in paganism. Today, many Muhammadans will find it extremely hard to digest this fact. However, Muhammad's pagan origin is disclosed by Hisham ibn al-Kalbi. On page 17 of his very important work, Kitab al-Asnam, the book of idols, he writes, We have been told that the Apostle of Allah once mentioned al-Uzza saying, I have offered a white sheep to al-Uzza while I was a follower of the religion of my people. In the statement above, Muhammad clearly admits his past adherence to the paganism of his tribe the then religion of the Quraysh. When Muhammad married Khadija, his first wife, who was a Hanifiyya, that is one who believed only in the God of Abraham, being neither a follower of the laws of Moses nor of Jesus, she introduced him to her uncle, Waraka bin Nawfal, who had converted from paganism to Christianity. There is absolutely no doubt that Khadija's and Waraka's religious influences were singularly instrumental in making Muhammad think deeply about his pagan religious beliefs. As he attended the annual assembly of poets at Ukaz, he was deeply impressed and moved by the thoughts, eloquence, sentiment, free thinking and humanism expounded by many of those poets. He started questioning the idol worshipping of his tribe and began at the age of 40 years, 15 years after marrying Khadija, to start preaching the concept of the one God, the Creator, similar to the concept of the Jews and Judaized Arabs of his days. Nonetheless, as the Quranic verses amply demonstrate, he was confused as to which God ought to be his one and only God. Allah at that time was the supreme rock God of the pagan Quraysh. From Muhammad's perspective, their only fault was that besides Allah, the Quraysh used to worship as intercessors with Allah, other smaller gods and goddesses like Hubal, Al-Lat, Al-Uzza, Al-Manat, etc. So, at the start of his new concept of an almighty creator, Allah was out of the question. Besides, at that time, even the magicians, the soothsayers, the sorcerers, and Satan worshippers used to vow by Allah. Thus, Muhammad at the very beginning found it utterly unacceptable to make Allah his only god, Ilah. During those pagan days, the people of Yemen used to worship another deity whose name was Ar-Rahman, who was coincidentally also the Jewish word Rahmana, which was a name for God in the Talmudic period. They were still influenced by the legacy of the Judaized Himyarite kingdom of the Yemen. Muhammad for a while adopted the name Ar-Rahman for God in place of Allah. Muhammad believed that by using the name Ar-Rahman, he ought to be able to get the support of the Judaized Arabs to his new belief system. Please note that nowhere in the Quran does Allah say that he has 99 additional names, including Ar-Rahman. In fact, these alleged names are actually attributes, sifat, and not names, that were heaped later on on Allah by the followers of Muhammad. So, when he declared himself to be the messenger of Ar-Rahman, the Meccans too were at a loss and confused. The Meccans did not know of any Ar-Rahman other than Ar-Rahman of Al-Yaman. When we read with an unbiased mind the first 50 surahs in chronological order of the Quran, we note Muhammad's confusion regarding Lord, Rabb, Allah and Ar-Rahman. He was quite unsure of whom he should consider as his only God, Ilah. Here is a summary of the first 50 surahs regarding Muhammad's idea of his only God. Lord Rabb in 11 surahs. Ar-Rahman and Lord Rabb in 2 surahs. Ar-Rahman, Allah Lord, 1 surah. Allah Lord Rabb, 18 surahs. This demonstrates Muhammad's initial vacillation, confusion and ignorance of the affairs of his only God, Ilah. 
The Quran also confirms that when he started to preach his brand of faith, Muhammad was lost, confused, and did not know much of religion. Here's what the Quran writes. Yusuf 12.3 We do relate unto thee the most beautiful of stories, in that we reveal to thee this Quran. Before this, thou too wast among those who knew it not. Al-Shu'ara 42.52 And thus have we, by our command, sent inspiration to thee. Thou knowest not before what was revelation and what was faith. Al-Zuhr 93.7 and he found thee wandering, and he gave thee guidance. In all three verses, they assert that previously Muhammad, as a pagan, had no knowledge of earlier revelations, the Bible. Maryam, 19.58 We carried with Noah and of the posterity of Abraham and Israel, of those whom we guided and chose. Whenever the signs of Ar-Rahman were rehearsed to them, they would fall down in prostrate adoration and in tears. Gardens of Eternity, those which Ar-Rahman promised to his servants. Al-Anbiya 21.112 Say, O my Lord, Rabbi, judge thou in truth. Our Lord, Rabbina, Ar-Rahman is the one whose assistance should be sought. Initially, Muhammad even eulogized the important gods or idols of the pagans by agreeing with the Quraysh. At some point, that these gods were intercessors of Allah, the satanic verses. On the same page, Hisham ibn al-Kalbi writes, the Quraysh were wont to circumambulate the Kaaba and chant, and Najm 53.19, by Allah and Al-Uzza, Al-Manat, the third idol besides, verily they are the most exalted females, Al-Gharaniq al ulat whose intercession is to be sought. Allah, Al-Uzza and Al-Manat were the daughters of Allah, who were supposed to intercede before Allah, the supreme rock, pagan god of the Quraysh. Muhammad, in a moment of desperation and weakness, to try and bring his Quraysh tribe to his way of thinking, compromised his monotheism by allowing himself to state that he received the above revelation from Allah. The above represent the satanic versus controversy whereby Satan allegedly was able to easily mislead Muhammad into allowing his followers to have partners with Allah, as they had under paganism. That is, to allow the three daughters of Allah to share his divine throne by being intercessors between humanity and Allah. When Muhammad realized the enormity of his error, that he had compromised his monotheism, he later very conveniently abrogated verses 21 and 22 and replaced them with the following. 53.21 What? For you the male sex and for him the female? Behold, such would be indeed a division most unfair. To cover up the fact that he had compromised his monotheism, Muhammad found that the best scapegoat is to very conveniently blame the unsuspecting and totally innocent Satan. Being the self-proclaimed prophet of Allah, Muhammad always blamed others for all his own errors, troubles and failures. I would like our listeners, both believers and unbelievers, to ponder the following irrefutable fact that the alleged monotheist Muhammad, venerated, circumambulated, kissed and hugged the black stone, even when the Kaaba still contained all 360 idols of the Quraysh and was still a pagan temple all his adult life. He only destroyed the idols of the Kaaba except the black stone after he conquered Mecca a year before he died. Whom would you listeners believe? The records of Muhammad and Islam or the apologists and perverters of facts and reality who serve their agenda of deceiving humanity about the very essence of Muhammad.